So why is that? Is that because of declines in ecosystem services, congestion, changing values and preferences? Some folks have ventured to say it's a disengagement from nature, too much fun with video games. I certainly see that in my house. I don't know if you see that in yours. Uh, untangling the ecosystem service component from the other components that lead to these kinds of trends are really an interesting challenge, but they're the ones that keep us puzzled. So this is not something that's unique to these particular countries. Um, let me skip that one. Uh, this is probably well known to most folks. Hunting licenses, recreational fishing, but also campsite visits. So we're seeing over time this declining trend in participation in outdoor activities, and we're trying to untangle the linkage between that ecosystem services and depreciation or investment in those services. I think that's one of the puzzles that we'll have to deal with. But at least this one provides us with a link to the market. This is an image on boreal caribou. And you can't read the legend on this, but let me just say that as you move to yellow and red away from the green colors, these are indicating areas where these, these particular herds are not likely to survive given current conditions. Now that's one that's really hard. What are the ecosystem services? We try to tie that into a market and think about the economic value of these. It's very difficult. We're trying to do it, but it's very challenging to try to build this into the kind of uh, gross national product in index that we're working with. These are one of the cases where I think we can worry about valuation and thinking about market values, but at the same time, we're going to have to start implementing mechanisms, collective mechanisms, to try to integrate concepts of thresholds or limits or something to try to stop irreversible change, but do them in a cost-effective way. And let me go to this. So what should we do? This is kind of a textbook list. It's a textbook list of things that an economist would prescribe for maintaining natural capital in the context of other capital stocks. And I think I've heard them all mentioned at some point during the day. The full cost principle. So recognize environmental impacts when you can. If that means that we have to tax CO2 emissions, so be it. That's a full cost accounting mechanism. The cost effectiveness principle. In a case like Caribou, identifying what a threshold or a target will be using a cost-effective approach to achieve that target or threshold that might be offsets. We've talked about biodiversity offsets or caribou offsets in this context. It's possible we could implement that um, across caribou ranges. We could imagine other kinds of cost-effective mechanisms. The property rights principle, often we inappropriately use natural capital because the property rights are not well-defined. That might be cases in, in carbon. It's more likely a case in the developing world where property rights for land are not well defined. The sustainability principle. Invest non-resolvable resource rents. What does that mean? Well, remember that graph that showed when we're extracting non-renewable resources, that's a negative on our overall capital components. In theory, if we want to be sustainable, we have to reinvest those back into another form of capital, whether that's natural capital, as a way of providing support for provision of ecosystem services, or into human capital, or into something else. One of the basic principles is if we want to be sustainable, we have to do those reinvestments of non-renewable resources because they don't regenerate themselves. And so that's a fairly straightforward policy prescription and one that we could think of as being able to implement positive change and avoiding irreversibilities, like losses of endangered species. And the last one's the information principle, which goes without saying, we provide extension information or more information so people can make better decisions voluntarily, so be it. That can be a good, a good way to practice and a good investment in funds. Now, I've written stewardship on the side of this because I think really to a certain extent these all reflect different kinds of stewardship. The bottom one, stewardship in that individuals will uptake their own action based on information, but these other ones, cost-effective treatments, are collective stewardship cases, collective responsibility to try to achieve an outcome at least cost. This is a schematic on how one might actually do this uh, from a few colleagues in a very interesting project out of Stanford. Thanks, Dave. Just indicating the linkages between the decisions that we make, thinking about the impact on the environment and on ecosystem services, translating that into what the impact is in economic terms, 
using that information to change institutions, which might be payments for environmental services, or it could be carbon taxes, or it could be some other institutional frame, and then coming back up and seeing how we're doing, revising the decision frame. So this sort of a structure is just this natural continuous improvement model, but applied to the notion of maintaining natural capital or enhancing the provision of ecosystem services. Lots of folks around the world are trying these. This is a list of market-based programs, cost-effectiveness programs, focused directly on land use programs. I, th I think folks are going to have access to these PowerPoints, so uh, if you want some of these websites, they'll be up there. Um, in some cases, people in these places have learned and we can take advantage of what they've done and perhaps not make mistakes that they've implemented. Uh, I would say we're still early days in this country, but some of these programs have been going on in other parts of the world for quite some time. We have an opportunity to take advantage of the learnings that they've done, whether it's the Australians or U.S. folks or others. Uh, I'm going to skip that one in the interest of time. Uh, there's some pretty neat things happening, though, in our own backyard. We do have some interesting initiatives on greenhouse gas emissions, on, on managing greenhouse gas emissions. The Institute for Agriculture, Forestry, and the Environment, interesting discussions about market-based instruments in land use. The land use framework and the recent legislation that's passed has got some very useful enabling clauses for tools that will allow us to integrate these economic dimensions into environmental protection. Uh, conservation auctions in various parts of the world, or uh, various parts of the country, and a kind of shameless plug. If, if you're interested in a group that's actually trying to motivate a kind of issues-based discussion, as Preston Manning described, on exactly this topic, integrating the environment and the economy, have a look at sustainableprosperity.ca. It's got an academic component, but it's also got an issues upreach, uh, outreach program uh, that's certainly worth investigating. Okay, so let me do two slides to wrap this thing up, and I, I might even finish on time. Okay, Dave's giving me the thumbs up. So, back to the same issues. We're learning. We're learning how to actually measure in similar terms what the impact on the natural environment is and how we can compare that to our, our standard economic out, outcomes, we can use that to help guide reinvestment. Uh, stewardship, in my opinion, is going to be enhanced not only by individuals being more informed and taking action, but also by us collectively deciding on limits, deciding on mechanisms to achieve those limits at least cost, and doing a better job of actually integrating the economy and the environment. We live in a market system. We're not likely to change that. The sooner we find ways to send these signals of scarcity of ecological services back through the market system, the better we'll align those mechanisms. And I think it's always worth remembering that even though we're concerned about a variety of environmental conditions in this part of the world, uh, we are having an impact through climate change and through greenhouse gas emissions on other parts of the world, and some of their sustainability balances don't look quite as good as ours. And I'm going to finish with um, a, a bit of a different perspective. Margaret Atwood. In fact, I'm surprised that Margaret Atwood hasn't come up yet. Um, has written this fascinating new book on, on debt. Uh, some really interesting concepts and topics in there. And this is a little quote. I love this part of the book because um, I, I love Scrooge and the, and the Charles Dickens story. So this is Scrooge being visited by uh, one of the spirits, but talking about ecological debt. We grew out of that crude sacrifice stuff. We approached things rationally. Science, cost-benefit analysis. Sounds great, right? Uh, the spirit says nature's an expert in cost-benefit analysis. She does her accounting a little differently, and for debts, she always collects in the long run. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to frame the issue, but I would actually say we need science, and we need cost-benefit analysis, but we need them done with the recognition of environmental services and the recognitions of values beyond what we normally think of as market goods and services, but a better approach to integrate those for environmental conservation. So I'll finish with Margaret Atwood. <laughs>